and welcome back today we are reading hellblazer number eight and just a little catch up on what was going on in the last couple issues zed has been kidnapped by the tongues of fire and the resurrection crusaders and in an effort to find her john had reached out to his friend richie who was really good with computers and he figured richie would be able to maybe break into the tongues of fire network and be able to look up where they're keeping zed but what John didn't know is that Richie was beyond just hacking in cyberspace. He'd actually found a way to hook himself up and send his consciousness into the matrix or cyberspace, or whatever you want to call it. So as John was hanging out in the computer room while Richie was doing that, Richie ended up stepping on, I guess it would be called like a digital landmine. It was some sort of security program. And Richie just thought, you know, it was some crazy experience he had. It actually unlocked this Nirvana state for him. But what he didn't know was that during that whole sequence of the bomb or trap going off, his body in reality had actually spontaneously combusted and John had to stand there and watch it happen. And John tried to put out the flames, but nothing really worked. And John could even hear Richie's voice still on the computer. So obviously his consciousness was still alive, but John didn't really know where to go from there. He didn't have the courage to tell Richie that Richie's body had burned up. So as Richie was telling him what he found out about the Tongues of Fire before that logic bomb went off, that there's a compound in Glastonbury, John was just keeping Richie talking until he traced the power wires back to the wall. And when Richie got back to the place he should have been able to exit the Matrix at, there was nothing there anymore because his body had burned up. And in desperation, he began to call to John asking what was going on. And instead of saying anything that really mattered, John just said he was sorry and he pulled the power cord out of the wall, which of course turned off all the power to the computers and mainframe that Richie was in. So it seems another one of John's friends has died while trying to help John out. And because of this on the way home, all of the ghosts of his past friends began to haunt him on a train and John began to freak out. So he jumped out of that moving train and then we just cut to black. So we don't really know what happened to John after he jumped out. And we ended the last issue with some doctors and the head of the Resurrection Crusaders talking about how Zed is psychologically perfect for whatever they're planning on doing, and all they need to do is get her some re-education. And there's a center where they do that, and that is in Glastonbury. And as Richie said earlier, that is where he told Constantine to go. So first things first with issue eight, we got the cover here. We see the naked body of a man screaming out in agony, and there's all these tubes of blood connected to his arms and neck. But he's also kind of faded in the background, so we can't really see if it's John or just who it is. And then going down the right side of the cover, we see all this iconography of what looks like maybe a chapel or some kind of Catholic cathedral. And there's also a face of a woman who looks kind of sad with her eyes that are in like shadow. And then there's a picture of a window below her, but the perspective is from the inside. So all we can see is the really bright sun showing through the panes, but it seems to be showing where Kit is being held. And also these pictures that are running down the right side are actual photographs. So it seems like the artist who did this cover used a lot of mixed media. And we see that this issue is written by Jamie Delano with art by John Ridgway and Alfredo Alcala. And on the first page, we see what looks like a castle in the distance and there's like snow covering everything. So I don't know how much time has passed, but it definitely wasn't snowing in the last issue. So Either it snowed really quickly or it's been a couple months. And we see over the panel with the castle, the narration says, Glastonbury, a place blessed in myth and legend. In this fertile earth, now draped in chilly virgin sheets, it is said Joseph of Arimathea once planted his staff and watched it sprout into a sacred tree. Now, a new crusader castle stands sentinel over this English holy land. From here, God's warriors ride out to do their master's work. And under this narration, we get like a closer look of that castle and we see on the wall in front of the front gate, it says resurrection crusade, retreat and sanctuary, no admittance. Then we cut to who we can assume is Zed looking out the window, but you wouldn't really know it if you remember what Zed looked like before, because when John first met her, or I think around issue three or four, she was all punked out. She had like big hair that was teased out and it was dyed white and black. She had a bunch of makeup on her face. But now 
Her hair has been cut very short and it is just pure white. And where she used to be wearing like leather and striped spandex, she was just wearing a plain white robe. And if you remember, she was going to Glastonbury to get some re-education, they said. So it definitely seems like that has taken place. And over the panel of her looking out the window, the narration says, home again, her great adventure finished as if she'd never been away. The brief flower of freedom whose nectar had so excited her tongue is faded now, crumbling into dust. Was it real or just a dream? Was there ever a woman called Zed who lived in Babylon, who chose the paths she wished to walk, who created destiny for a while and had a man called John? So I guess because she's been re-educated, she can barely remember John's name. And all of what took place before with John seems kind of like a distant fantasy to her now. We also see two men walk into her room and kind of beckon her to follow them, and so she does. And as she walks, the narration continues. Or was there ever only this girl, this child, this daughter, a frail handmaiden to the Lord, lonely and afraid? Then we see as she follows the two men, they walk into a room where all these other people are dressed in robes, and she is brought in between them like down an aisle. So it seems there is some kind of ceremony going on where she is the center of it. And her narration continues. Once more they name her Mary. They take her by the hands, leading her from temptation, and submerge her in still waters, dissolving memory, anxiety, and fear. At least in Glastonbury, she doesn't have to choose. Here, it's she who is chosen. So as this narration is going on, we see the men lead her to a pool of water in front of the whole congregation, and the men help her lay down into a shallow pool of water, and then she is baptized. Which, if you don't know, is just a Christian ritual which kind of symbolizes being washed clean of your past sins. And for some sects of Christianity, this is more symbolic, and others, they actually believe it does that exactly. And the way that they're showing this, it makes it seem like this sect of Christianity is definitely taking it like it's actually happening because they need her to be clean for this ritual. So as Zed is washed clean and then brought out of the pool, she kneels before the pulpit of, I guess, the preacher or maybe the head of this church. And he begins his sermon with a prayer, praying for her, saying, Bless this prodigal daughter who has returned to our fold. Lend strength to her body through prayer so that she may serve heaven most mightily. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! For yea, the world draws near its end, daily dragged deeper into the morass of hell. Agents of Satan walk freely among the people, mocking the works of God, strangling innocence in its cradle, and spreading vile contagion. Men struggle against men, following false prophets and baying packs, like vicious sheep mutated by hell's vitriol. The Lord has turned away his face, waiting for a sign that we are worthy. The resurrection crusade must demonstrate our readiness to receive his shining grace, that we have chosen the light. We need not wait for Armageddon. We call God to us. Speak to him with tongues of fire. And all the congregation yells out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! But we see Zed is just keeping her head down and being quiet. And then the congregation walk towards her and they pick her up and they begin to kind of push her to the back one by one. So they're actually like making her crowd surf over top of them. And they're moving her to the back where we see some big doors are open and there's a shining white light coming through. But we can't see what's on the other side of the doors. And as they move her over their heads, the narration says she feels a hundred hands laid on, bearing her on a raft of exhalation across the sea of rapture, passing her to glory. And then as we turn the page, we see she has already been brought to a room where she's laying on a surgical table. And we see two men standing on either side of the table. One of them we've never seen before, and the other is the George Bush Sr. looking man who seems to be a very high up member of this organization. So both of them take either side of the cart and they begin to wheel it towards a bunch of doctors who are scrubbed up and are wearing surgical garments. So it looks like they're gonna do some sort of procedure to her. And the narration as they do this says, they take her down, down to the sanctum of the tongues of fire. In this temple of technology, the last protests of free will are silenced. So as they begin to put her under anesthesia, one of the doctors asks the George Bush senior looking guy, the re-indoctrination is complete? She's mentally prepared now? And the George Bush senior looking guy says yes. And with that, the doctor turns around and puts on his surgical gloves and he says, Good. 
The final adjustments are all surgical. Go now and leave her to our intensive care. And the words intensive care are in bold because that is actually the name of this issue. And as we turn the page, we cut to John Constantine, who seems to be in some sort of prison or facility because he's also wearing a white gown and it seems he's locked in a very large empty room. So it looks like he's in solitary confinement. And on the single door, there is a window and it's very small, but a little bit of light comes through it. And as he sits there, his narration says, silence, darkness grayed by sick light, fear. Inside me, nausea quivers, solid and black. Who am I? Where am I? And then we get a panel of him looking very alert at the door, like he's scared. And the narration says, out of the silence, footsteps walk, echoing as if they paced a tomb or prison. My body aches and trembles. Why? Why am I here? Why am I afraid of the light? And then the door bursts open and lets a bunch of light in. And we see two police officers come in. And one of them says, All right, Constantine, you filthy little pervert. Get on your bleeding feet. And then they walk him out of that room and onto what looks like a cell block from a prison. And it looks like the cages are very, very crowded because there are hundreds of arms sticking out trying to grab at John as the guards push him by. And the narration says, out in the light, they can all see me. And the prisoners are yelling to John, give him to us. We know what to do with his sort. And as they walk past them and down some stairs, the people are still yelling saying, give the bastard hell. Make him sing boys, it'll be a lullaby. So it seems they're all very excited to see John get whatever he's got coming to him from the guards. And as John walks down the stairs with the guards behind him, pushing him forward, his narration says, anger stabs from the shadows like homemade knives. Hatred batters me with rubber hose and loathing chills my flesh like a bath of ice. A poison spring of guilt wells up, but what's my crime? Then we see the guards handcuff his hands around a pipe in the ceiling. So John is fully stretched out because the pipe is pretty high in the ceiling. So he's either hanging or he's barely able to touch the ground with his toes. So as John watches the guards do something, we see one of them pull out what looks like electrodes. So basically just two handles that have metal rods coming out of them with electrical wires coming out of the handles. And the guard holding them says, this is where you get yours animal and it's going to be a pleasure. I've got a daughter just the same age as that kid in Newcastle. And as that guard approaches John with the electrodes, the other guard says, we can't do what you did to her. We're human, but we can sure as hell make you suffer. And then the guard with the electrodes begins tapping the pieces of metal together, which creates a spark in front of John's face, scaring him. And you may have guessed it, but at that moment of the sparking, that actually wakes him up from a dream. So as he wakes up, his narration says, I open eyes that feel like they've been stitched shut for a hundred years. Momentary relief floods my system. And then John says out loud, just a dream, another bloody nightmare. But then as we zoom out in the next panel, we see John is actually physically tied down to a medical gurney. And someone reaches out and touches John's shoulder and says, a nightmare? Is that how it seems to you, John? Just another bad night? Was it a nightmare for the girl too? And John says, girl, what girl? What the hell are you doing here, piggy? And this here is kind of a deep cut because this guy is actually introduced in Swamp Thing during the Rick Veach run. And it turns out this guy was someone John knew back in the day that kind of obsesses over John and he eventually became a psychiatrist. And in that Swamp Thing run, he actually tortures John for a little bit too. So as John asks what Piggy's doing here, Piggy looks at him and says, doing? Why, I'm here to help you, John. To help you understand what's wrong with you. To help you get, well... To be a safe, sane member of society. Don't you remember the girl, John? Don't you remember what you did to her in Newcastle? And then we get a memory or possibly a vision of something John sees that is of a young girl who's smiling at him at first, but then her face begins to turn from flesh color to a weird light purple. Then her face begins to morph and change like her nose gets longer, kind of like Voldemort from Harry Potter or something. And then her skin ends up being completely blue and she gets fangs and a forked tongue. And then John's narration says over this, of course I remember. How could anyone forget? So John says to Piggy, she was possessed by demons. We tried to help her, but it all fouled up. Gary Lester lost his bottle, didn't he? Then the thing, then the thing killed her. 
And as John talks, we see Piggy get a syringe and begin to fill it with something. And as he flicks the air out of it and pushes a little bit of liquid out of the syringe, he says, hmm, killed her is an understatement, I think. And then Piggy leans forward to inject John with whatever's in the syringe. And John yells, Christ, man, I tried. I tried to hold it. But with the circle broken, there was no chance. I hung on till the end. It nearly had me too. It wasn't my fault. Then we see Piggy attaching electrodes to John's head. And Piggy says, oh dear, John. I hope the electric shop therapy would shatter those paranoid delusions. It's vital that you face the evil in your soul. We'll have to increase the voltage two points. And this time, John, please try to see the light. And as Piggy is about to press the button to begin the electroshock therapy, John says, No, wait, you bastard. You're enjoying this. But Piggy doesn't wait. He actually pushes the button, and we get a giant panel of John being electrocuted. Then, as you might have guessed again, John wakes up, because that was all a dream. And this time, he's again in a hospital bed, but he is now bandaged head to toe. And his narration says, I wake up for the third time. It's hot, stifling. My mouth tastes as if I've been chewing chalk. My head throbs and my body's a dull aching thing. But at least the pain assures me that this time I've surfaced to reality. Where though? I'm not in my bed, nor Zed's. It's the smell that gives the game away. Antiseptic, sickness, death. I'm in a bleeding hospital. And when I say John is bandaged all over, we can't really see what his body looks like, but his head has bandages all over his skull and even covering his jaw, so maybe his jaw is even broken. So now that John realizes he's in a hospital, he begins to think back on what happened, and he's having flashes of last issue where Richie was burning up, and the narration says, I trawl my mind's dark swirling waters for the elusive fish of memory. Contact made. Cold, wriggling realization swims my body. I remember Richie Simpson, flesh crisped and seared, air choked with the cloying reek of hamburger. Poor sod. My fault. I sent him into the computer to check out the tongues of fire. Another friend used up. No wonder I have guilty dreams. Then we see him remember all his friends who were ghosts, and the narration continues. Then I was on the train, feeling like death warmed over. The ghosts were there giving me a hard time as usual. I lost my cool, as usual, and stormed out, forgetting that we were rattling at 60 miles an hour through the night. Then pain, a deep mossy woody smell, and all was black. So right here we get a panel of John passed out on the ground, looking pretty broken, and we see the shadowy figure of Swamp Thing appear, and that was what John was smelling in the blackness. So as we look over, we can't really, like I said, see what John looks like underneath the blankets, but he is getting a blood transfusion, so it's obviously pretty serious what he went through. And I'm not sure if John actually registers that Swamp Thing was the one who saved him and brought him here, but he does say to himself out loud, even though he's got a bandaged jaw, Jesus, what a bloody stupid Burke. And his narration over this panel says, Embarrassment warms my face. Small wonder I'm in intensive care. I should count myself lucky I didn't wake up in the morgue. I'd better slow down. Start using whatever brains are left unscrambled. But first, I need to see how badly I've mangled this frail mortal form. So he kind of tilts his head up, and we get a full pulled back panel to see what the rest of his bed looks like, and it's not good. John is in literally a full body cast, and his limbs are being held up by support wires that are attached to frames that are kind of making sure his limbs do not move at all. And as John sees this, his narration says, It's not good. Both legs in plaster, an arm too. My head feels twice its normal size. Ribs grind together when I breathe. Jesus, what a bloody mess. And then John looks over and he sees a policeman sitting in a chair next to him. And the policeman is currently sleeping, but that is definitely a concerning sign to John. And as he sees the man, John thinks, and uh oh, why are the old Bill camped outside my door? Things don't look too rosy. Footsteps coming this way too. And the footsteps John is hearing is the footsteps of a doctor that is approaching his room and eventually walks into his room. And as the doctor comes in, John's narration says, I think I'll play dead for a while. I'm not up to handling visitors. I need to get my head together. So as John plays dead, we see the doctor observe John and then the doctor begins to flip through John's chart. But John isn't moving at all and his narration says, 
I feel their presence in the room. A doctor or a nurse, I guess. I keep my breathing shallow, measured, and I wait for them to leave. But beneath my tongue, a hard, smooth, nervous egg is growing, as if fear pecked with a tiny beak to break through its shell and fill my mouth. And of course, whenever you're trying to not move or not do anything, you begin to cough or you want to laugh or something. So John actually begins to cough and the narration continues. I gag on rank feathers, choking out the squawking hatchling. The tension grows, but I force myself to keep my eyes tightly closed. Sweat springs in gems of liquid terror from my brow. Then something touches me, damp and cold. A towel? A sponge in some kind nurse's hand? So in these panels, we're just getting a shot of Constantine's face as he's going through these thoughts. So we're seeing like the sweat go down his brow, but it's just focused on his face. And we see something that is obviously not a towel or a sponge wipe his forehead. And this thing is bright pink. And as we get a closer look, it actually has weird green pustules on it. And the thing doesn't just stop at his forehead. It begins to move around John's face entirely. So like over his eyes, his ears, his lips. And as it does this, John's narration says, I sniff for the clean linen scent of health, but find only a heavy sour reek, a warm, wet dog freshly gorged on meat. The voice flows like sewage in my ear. And then whatever this thing is says, Constantine, John Constantine. And as the pink thing begins to move more across John's face, his narration says, the damp touch circles my face, then moistens and parts my lips. And we're seeing green liquid drip off of the front of this pink thing. And I guess because the thing is parting his lips, that's more than John can handle. So he breaks the facade. And as he opens his eyes, he sees staring at him at the end of the bed is not a doctor, but is in fact the demon Nergal. And reaching all the way from the end of the bed from Nergal's mouth, his tongue is what was licking John's sweat and licking his ear and then parted his lips and basically French kissed John. And then Nergal's body doesn't move, but the head of Nergal actually grows its neck super long. So now he's looking at John face to face and the narration says, a flood of boiling terror picks me up and whirls me, helpless in its foam. I throw out a vain anchor of desperate wit. So as John stares at the demon's face, he sarcastically says, I know the health service is in bad shape, but recruiting demon doctors must be an all time low. And then Nergal shrinks back his neck and then walks over to John's side and says, Ah, Constantine, I'm sorry. Did I startle you? You looked so peaceful lying there. I was afraid you'd shuffle off the mortal coil. And then Nargal reaches out and puts his hand on John's forehead, and John looks very nervous at this, and Nargal continues, I was just going to take your temperature. Shall we call it a slip of the tongue? And up until this point, John has never really met Nargal. The only interaction he's had with him is through the Damnation Army. So the serial killer guy that tried to kill his niece and then the neo-Nazi skinhead monster that tried to capture Zed. So Nergal has been far in the background. So John didn't really know who was doing all that stuff with the Damnation Army. So John doesn't really know anything that's going on with this random demon. And he says, call it whatever you like, pal but I never kiss anyone till I've been introduced. And then Nergal walks back to the other side of John's bed. And as he does that, he says, you mean you don't remember me? I'm hurt. We're old acquaintances. Why, it's been scant weeks since we last spoke. Surely you recall our telephone conversation in which I invited you to join my little band of horrorists. And as Nergal says this, we see him kind of look at the transfusion bottle of blood that's hanging next to John. And then he begins to finger the line that is going into John's arm. And John says, so you're the Joker behind the damnation army. Well, you're sniffing around the wrong lamppost here, chum. One thing I learned from my old dad, never volunteer. And as Nergal begins to play with the transfusion hose, he says to John, oh dear, have I misled you? I didn't mean to imply you had a choice. Your cooperation is not requested, but required. And then he grabs John's arm and begins to tug on the transfusion hose that is hooked into the vein in John's hand. And he says, I fear your circumstance precludes refusal. You see, you are helpless. And then Nergal pulls the transfusion needle out of John's hand 
and he begins to suck on the end of it. And of course, this kind of hurt John, so he cries out. But as usual, John is still trying to keep a brave face. So as Nergal sips the blood out of the transfusion bottle, he says, You silly prat! Do you think I'm scared of pain? And then he motions to his legs that are being held up by the wires, and he says, What can you do? Break my bloody legs? <laughs> but Nergal's not phased by this, and he actually walks over to a flower vase, and he picks the whole thing up, and it's full of flowers, and he says, Hurt you? No. You I need complete. I had hoped you would be eager to help me topple the resurrection crusade. And as he says this, he actually begins to form the flowers and vase into a glass sphere that is melted just by his hands. And as John watches this, he says, You've got me all wrong, mate. I'm not the joining type. I always work alone. Why change the habit of a lifetime? And Nergal answers, Revenge, perhaps. Or jealousy? It would be natural to avenge the murder of your friend, the Catamite Ray Mondi. And this is the first time that John is hearing that his friend Ray was murdered, because if you remember, John was away when the Resurrection Crusaders showed up at Ray's house and kidnapped Zed and beat Ray to death. And as John says what in surprise to that revelation, Nergal continues, And to come to the aid of an abducted lover. And with that, Nergal shows John the sphere that he's made. I guess he's just showing John his power, because John says, Ray's dead? Oh no. The bastards and Zed, they took her. And Nergal says, I'm afraid it's true. The tongues of fire have her. Even now, they bend her to their will in Glastonbury. And as Nergal says that, he throws the orb into the air and he crunches down on the glass. Once again, I'm not sure why he's doing this. It just seems like he's trying to intimidate John. So as Nergal eats that glass, John thinks, Jesus. I'm in the crap right up to my bloody neck. Ray and Richie both killed. No wonder the police have marked my card. I feel like a puppeteer who's been tangled in the strings. A line from Yates wanders through my mind. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. And as John sits there thinking, Nergal finishes eating the glass and then looks at John and says, So, will you join us? And then Nergal sticks out his tongue again like he's going to lick John's face. And John winces at this and says, No, for the last time. I don't work for heaven or hell. And Nergal replies, Do you like it here? I find the ambience most energizing. Suffering is such a seductive scent. It whets my appetite. And then we get a panel of Nergal reaching his arm through the floor that John is on into the floor below. And Nergal says, Below this floor is the maternity ward. Imagine it, a veritable chocolate box of fragile, mewling innocence. I don't know if I can resist. And then we see he's reaching down into a baby's crib of a newborn, and he begins to tickle the baby's chin with his gross, yellow, super long, sharp nail. And he continues, Do you think they'd miss just one or two? And John is horrified by the thought of babies being killed by this demon because he will not accept the offer that Nergal is making him. So before Nergal can go any further with that baby, John yells out, No, wait, I'll listen. Tell me why I'm so important to your plan. So hearing this, Nergal brings his hand out of the maternity ward and back into John's room, and he says, You mean, you do not know? You disappoint me. And John says, Yeah, well... I've got a lot on me plate at the moment. Bloody elementals going all loopy, you know. And this is also like a deep cut. He's talking about Swamp Thing when he talks about elementals. So hearing John talk about elementals, Nergal says, Yes, even those primitives are unsettled by these troubled times. And then Nergal leaves John's bedside and walks over to the window and looks out at the night sky and he says, An era is passing, Constantine. For centuries, the realms of darkness and of light have shared the bounty of this world, grazing in roughly equal measures the vast rolling plains of human souls. And then Nergal begins to carve a pentagram in the glass with his nail, and he continues, Like bison occasionally locking horns for push and shove, but always the contest was circular. Ground gained on one front was lost on another. And then John interrupts him saying, 
All right, you can skip the primary metaphysics. Just give me the details. I'm out of grade school now. So Nergal continues. Yes, I recall you were an insolent child. I gave you a lesson once in manners. And John is confused by this. He says, what do you mean? And Nergal answers, no matter. It's not relevant now. We have new castles to besiege. And then Nergal continues his explanation of like what's going on between heaven and hell in the background saying, hell was content, perhaps complacent, lazy even. We did not need to prophetize our cause. Numerous pilgrims offered themselves willingly to our court, but then something occurred in which you played a minor part. Humans learned secrets they had no right to share, and stupidly, they tried to make a gift of the earth to the antique blackness that had lain quiet for eons far beyond the walls of hell. And all this stuff that Nergal is talking about was things that happened in Swamp Thing where John gathered the mystical forces of the DC universe, which ended up becoming Justice League Dark eventually, and fought back and pushed against this thing called the Void that was being brought back by a weird ancient cult of shamans called the Brujeria. And John was able to stop that along with Swamp Thing and some of the other mystical characters. But what ended up happening from this is Hell was thrown into turmoil, which caused a bunch of factions to rise up in Hell, and that caused, I guess, this power struggle between Heaven and Hell at the same time. So Nergal continues the explanation fully, saying, They turned Hell on its head, set demon against devil, plunged us into civil war. The agents of Heaven were not slow to seize their chance. The Resurrection Crusade is their net cast wide to scour the world of souls and set them on God's table. The tongues of fire are their gutting knife. And then John chimes in saying, cut out the obscure metaphors and give me the bottom line, mate. So Nergal does and he continues saying, there has been a prophecy, incontrovertible, engraved on a stone dredged up from hell. It predicts that at the end of winter solstice, a conjunction between nature and supernature, a birth. And then Nergal gets really close to John's face and grabs him by his chin and says, it's happening again. God born of a woman and the female you call Zed, they call the Mary. The child will be a healing power in this realm. And John asks, so why didn't you just kill her? And Nergal replies, I tried, but you interfered. Now it's too late. They've taken her to their stronghold of arcane science, where my diminished power could not prevail. And now John's finally starting to get it, so he says, You think you can use my relationship with Zed to throw a spanner in the works? And if I don't, you'll start eating babies out of spite? And then Nergal says, Yes. And then he reaches out and begins to play with the wires that are holding John's legs up. And as he begins to pluck them, kind of like guitar strings, John begins to yell out in pain, and then Nergal says, I'm sorry, but your predicament inspires me with an idea for a musical machine. A project for calmer times, perhaps. Then it seems like Nergal gets an idea, and he says, We should not delay. I sent the dismal dawn. Let me think how best I might apply Hell's healing power to your wounds. And I guess John feels like he doesn't really have a choice because he just says, don't talk about it, just do it. So Nergal walks over to the blood transfusion bottle and he opens the top of it and he makes an incision in his wrist and it begins to flow blood into the transfusion vial. And as he does this, Nergal says, Very well. Although I warn you, fast remedies are extreme. And once the vial's full, then Nergal takes the needle that he was drinking from earlier that was in John's arm previously and he sticks it back in. And immediately, John feels the blood coursing through his veins, and his narration says, His blood invades my veins like raging lava. And John is in so much pain from the blood running through his veins that he actually sits up and begins screaming out loud, and he's moving and struggling so much that the plaster casts on his arms and legs begin to shatter as well. And we get this really interesting double page spread where we see John yelling out, but behind him we see like a skeleton version of his body that has like a yellow and red aura. And it looks like it's burning in pain as well. And then we see his yelling face up front and behind him, his human face is slowly morphing into Nergal's face. That's also yelling out. And John's narration continues saying, my muscles contract in frenzy, sending me thrashing, dancing, jerking like a spastic marionette. 
It's agony, but that dark secret lust for power responds. And finally, I am whole. So almost immediately, his body repairs itself now that the demon blood is inside of him. And as he stands up out of the medical bed kind of wobbly, John's narration says, Some vaguely simian voice within is chattering, telling me that things will never be the same. Now that a demon's juices course through my veins. Then Nargal conjures up a suit for John, and he hands it to him and says, There, it's sealed. My part of the bargain is complete. When it's done, then we shall meet. And then he creates a portal and walks through it and out of the room. So John gets dressed, and he decides to jump out the window because... Obviously, he can't exit through the front door because the police officers are waiting for him. But it seems like this new blood in him is creating like a very extreme power surge through his body because as he falls, it's interesting, the art shows him with like glowing yellow eyes as his body falls out of the window. And his narration says, Caged by my ribs, my heart screams like fighting cats. The demonic transfusion's done the trick all right, charging my body with fearsome energy. And as he lands, we see him take off running down the street and at a stoplight, he's able to jump onto the back of a truck. And his narration continues. Without a second thought, I leave behind a trail of friends betrayed, a dead policeman, a ruined hospital ward. But I slough off this burden with the furious joy of a slave shedding his shackles. Like Typhoid Mary trailing the plague in my wake, I move on to fresh fields. Not for the first time, I savor the liberating tang of pure evil. And we see as the truck drives away, it's definitely heading towards London. And as he walks on the streets of London, his narration continues saying, But by the time my roaring juggernaut has borne me back to town, my mask of immortality is fading and cracked. As the anxious city traffic traps us, and I feel like death thrown up over his dancing shoes. Disaster's snapping at my heels, and it's time that I was somewhere far away. It's all up to me again, isn't it? Somehow I've got to stay ahead and get some new aces up my sleeve. But right now, all I really need is a smoke. And we see as he's walking, he's going somewhere where it's like a travel agency because it says discount travel, USA, NYC, Miami, Chicago, lowest prices for immediate departure. So it seems he's planning on going to the States, I guess to get away for a second and clear his head and also probably help Swamp Thing out. And that, my friends, is the end of the issue. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And we will see you on the next one.